everyone. Hi, nice to see you. We have a terrific guest today. <laughs> uh, uh, we've been talking about Brandon Lee for a while and getting him on the show. Yes. And Brandon, welcome to our uh, post traumatic driving. Hey, it's good to be here with you guys. I don't know. Hopefully all good things have been said. Hopefully all good things. <laughs> all good things, my friend. All good things. Happy you're here. Yeah, really wonderful things. And, you know, we'll tease the audience a little bit and let you know that Brandon not only has a broadcaster voice uh, from <laughs> just hearing him right now, I love that voice. But, but he is a, he is a newscaster was you can tell us your story. We'll get into that story, but has won five Emmys tremendously successful but it didn't the story didn't always you know end up that way some very uh, dark times so brandon the way we like to start off is just jump right into it tell us where you were born and tell us about your childhood and tell us all about brandon lee yeah I, well again thankful that you guys asked me to share my story whenever anybody asks me to share my story i think it's very very important that those of us in recovery uh, use that as a platform to speak because I think breaking through the stigma is hugely important when it comes to trauma healing. Um, and when I speak around the country, you know, I always find it uh, very purposeful to say that I grew up a very, very privileged little white boy in Southern California. I mean, I grew up in Anaheim Hills, Newport Beach, Corona Del Mar. Um, really affluent neighborhoods. And I went to some of the best Catholic prep schools around. I graduated from Santa Margarita Catholic High School, which is right there in kind of Mission Viejo area. And, uh, you know, I never, when I say privilege, I mean this, I never had to worry about a roof over my head. I never had to worry about food on the table. I went to the best schools. Everything was provided for me. That in and of itself is privilege. Um, the reason why I share that is because, you know, we here on this podcast know that addiction does not discriminate, uh, but that is still very surface level to me. More importantly than that, trauma trauma does not discriminate. And, you know, all the money in the world, all the resources that were given to me, the best schools, I was in athletics, all that stuff. It did not protect me uh, from being repeatedly molested as a child from the ages of seven to 10 uh, by my next door neighbor, my youth soccer coach, and also my piano teacher who truly had unfettered access to me every Friday after school. And so, um, you know, from the outside looking in, I, I had a perfect life. I had a perfect little childhood because I went into survival mode. You know, when when trauma happens in those early formative years, it actually changes the makeup of the brain. It changes the wiring of the brain and we begin to misfire. You know, so it's no surprise now that I'm educated about trauma and the impact it has on our body and our brain that at age 15, I became a cocaine addict. Um, and I also became a sex worker in Laguna Beach. I mean, I would literally get done with high school at around 2.33 in the afternoon, go to soccer practice, and then drive home from Santa Margarita Catholic High School at age 16. And I would go through Laguna Beach. There's an old hotel there that used to be one of the most popular bars in Southern California for gay folks. It's called the Boom Boom Room. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's where I was. I mean, I would go to the Boom Boom Room at age 16 and I would hang out in the alleyway there and mm -hmm. I would get picked up by older men in their 40s and 50s. Um, and that was at, you know, 16, 17 years old. Um, you know, but in survival mode, you know, you go into fight or flight and, and survival mode really looked for me. I was an overachiever, both academically and athletically. And so I got really good grades um, and I got into NYU um, and moved to New York City. Um, and unfortunately, trauma really did follow me in the early stages of my life. I, I lived down on Wall Street and uh, I was on the train that morning uh, when the towers were hit on 9-11 um, and I was trapped underground. Um, and I don't really go into too much detail about what I saw and what I witnessed that day. I don't find it necessary, but I do tell people, you know, I saw a lot of things and experienced a lot of things that, you know, you shouldn't go through. Nobody should ever yeah. be exposed to that, you know, but mm -hmm. did I heal from it? No. Did I think that that was even a traumatic life event at the age of 21? No, I did not. And I'll tell you why I just always was in the frontal lobe, right? Always in the frontal lobe saying, you know, people around me have lost their lives. People have lost loved ones. They have every reason to grieve. You're alive. What do you have to complain about? You know, and I was working at NBC News at the time at the Today Show. And so um, I had to move out of my apartment. I never went back. It was it was destroyed in, during 9-11. And so I lived in a hotel and I was working at NBC News nonstop throughout that whole event. Wow. Wow. Well, that, that's, there's a lot to unpack there. Yes. Uh, I never <laughs> that, takes you to, that takes you to age 21. So. Yeah. But I never <laughs> even knew that part of your story. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit because we have 
actually a similar childhood because I grew up in Fullerton right up the street from Anaheim Hills. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I live in Laguna Beach now. And I just, in fact, this morning drove by the old boom, boom room. Mm -hmm. And then there was Woody's on the, there was, there's a, yeah, lot, right of, there. a lot of fun. Yeah, there. The, thing, the thing I like, <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a straight guy, but uh, Laguna Beach has always it's been um, very accepting of the LGBT community. Absolutely. Hugely accepting. Huge. Way before West Hollywood became West Hollywood. Right. Yeah. And before yeah, yeah. Palm Springs became Palm Springs, right? Yeah. As we know it yeah. today. But, you know, you know, what adults do, you know, whatever, but, you know, kids and, and it, so, it sounds like you had three predators in your life. Your, your Scott soccer coach, your piano teacher, and a, Next door a neighbor. neighbor and a neighbor. And this started, how, how young were you when this all started? Yeah. I mean, I can, it's hard for me to pinpoint the exact age, but around the ages of seven to 10 okay. um, is okay. when that abuse started. Yeah. And, and just to pause on that, I mean, childhood abuse, well, trauma in general, particularly childhood trauma mm -hmm. and particularly sex, uh, uh, sexual abuse of a child. Mm -hmm. If you're going to pick the pinnacle of, of getting a tough start in life, that would be it. In fact, it. one thing that shocked me, Brandon, because I volunteer at the uh, friendship shelter just down the street in Laguna and also up at San Quentin prison, a lot of the inmates uh, in fact, I think it's safe to say the majority of inmates were sexually abused yes. as young men mm -hmm. yes. uh, or as, as children, really. And that's why I am so I want to flip a school bus every time I hear about a pedophile. Yeah, because, you know, what adults do, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked on the Jeffrey Epstein case. You know mm. what, what happens with adults, whatever. Once you cross the that kids. line and and put your hands on a kid. Oh man, I'm with Jesus, yeah. you know, yeah. get the millstones ready. Yeah. Cause that's, that's, it impacts just, you the rest of your life. And, yeah. and I don't think people understand that. And that's why I speak out so much about it because I hate people who say that addiction is a moral failure. Um, I see 60 addicts a day, which we'll get into later in the, in the show, but you know, I see 60 addicts a day. Um, and a majority of them have, have, um, suffered child sex abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I just really, it really rubs me the wrong way, but I also understand it's just naivete. You know, the public just doesn't understand why people choose to numb out. And, mm -hmm. and I always say, it's not that I just have an addiction to alcohol and addiction to drugs. No, it was trauma. Trauma is the gateway, you know, and that's why I educate people. It's not tobacco. Marijuana is not the gateway drug. Trauma is the mm -hmm. gateway and yeah. unhealed trauma keeps people out. Absolutely. Well said, when I was yeah. working at Laguna Treatment Hospital, Brandon, in admissions, 99.99% .99 of the people had sexual abuse. Yeah. Some sort of domestic violence, sexual brain. assault. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and in prison, it's, they say 95, but who knows mm -hmm. the real number, but it's close to everyone. I just threw that number out, but it seems like 99.9. <laughs> well, it's the majority. I think yeah. we can yeah. all agree yeah. on yeah. that. But thank you so much for being candid about this because there are so many people we've had numerous guests on our show who have like really have experienced this and, you know, grow like, privileged as well. Growing up in Monarch Bay. I mean, my God, it's, I'm looking at the beach right now that I used to play on and you know, it's, this was just never part of my life journey or part of any experience. So every time I hear about these stories, um, literally I'm kind of like brand, uh, Randy, where I kind of want to throw over a school bus. Oh, I know it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, nothing, you know, fortunately, you know, you know, I had other, my thing was I was born with a congenital heart defect. So my childhood was a little screwed up by that, but, uh, Fortunately for me, I didn't have that situation in my life, um, but I have seen more and more people that have. Mm -hmm. I've seen the longitudinal is the term you use in, you know, study long term studies. The long term effects of this, and it's it's the most wicked, you know, destructive thing out there. Mm -hmm. Period. And the you thing know, with and the thing with trauma. Sorry, Randy. The thing with trauma is that it doesn't show up tomorrow. It doesn't show up today. It shows yeah, up no, years, sure, yeah. years later. Yeah. Right. It caught up with you. Yeah. So yeah, your courage it, of talking about it, Brandon, is is astounding. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go, what were we going to say, Brandon? Oh, yeah. You know, well, first off, I'm healed from it. And I think that's really important for, you know, for folks to understand. I can really speak openly about it because I finally have healed from it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as you know, doctor, that when, you know, 
when traumatic life events happens, we go into fight or flight and what our bodies, our bodies don't want to experience pain. We don't want to experience that uncomfortableness. And so we start in the frontal lobe and then we push that back to the lower part of our brains yeah. to the point where when we, you know, when time goes by and time does not heal all wounds, and those are terrible generational sayings mm -hmm. that were passed on from, you know, that's how generational trauma exists thinking that, oh, time will heal all. No, it doesn't heal all. It just actually suppresses it further into your body. Um, but eventually it's going to come to the surface. And so what I tell people all the time is that, yeah, you're in your forties, but childhood trauma that you experience is now coming to surface, right? And you don't even realize it's because of your childhood trauma. You may remember it, but you're like, ah, that happened so long ago. There's no way that this is, you know, even connected or correlated. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, if you're making poor life choices constantly over and over again, whether it's with a lover or whether it's in so many other aspects of your life, right? You've mm -hmm. got to go back and figure out where do the wires go crossed. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, the the mm -hmm. we the amygdala is what's at the base of the brain. Right. That's where all this memory mm -hmm. is uh, stored. That's it's called the reptilian brain because it's it's instinct. Correct. Right. And right. if you don't complete the trauma cycle and and resolve this thing, and which means digging it out and talking about it, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to reside there. And then triggers are going to bring it out in all kinds of series yep. of poor life decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so the <laughs> idea is to get the memory from, from the reptilian brain process. You have to reprocess. Through the, yeah. Absolutely. Through the mammal brain, which is the midbrain into the human brain, which is the logical brain where it's out in full consciousness. The idea is not to stuff it and forget about it. The idea is to talk about it Absolutely. so that when next time you talk about it, you're not triggered all over again. Right. So Absolutely. that's and the yeah, and that that's exactly right. I mean, that's a beautiful way to say it too. And you know, it's so important that you know when you do the reprocessing, you know that I always tell people, listen, talk therapy is not going to heal you from your trauma. Talk therapy will not heal you from your trauma. You've got to use a modality that gets you past the frontal lobe, which eventually we'll get to in the podcast because I practice shamanism through deep breath work, similar to EMDR. Mm -hmm. Through deep breath work in about seven to eight minutes, I'm able to drop in is what we call it, past the frontal lobe, and really reprocess all that childhood trauma as an adult to allow my inner child to understand that I got you now. You don't need to be in flight mode all the time. For yeah. example, of like for exactly when you say when I am triggered, I am not triggering what I call my inner child, little B, that he's not triggered and wanting to numb out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're paying attention to it. Yeah, and that's the physiology of it. And the nice thing is, is that science has gotten so good and understands it. The processes we're going to talk about are not terribly complex. They're actually no. very simple, but they're very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk, you know, when we get to that point, I'm anxious to get there because uh, there's a lot of research that's come out of Harvard with brain scans and meditation mm -hmm. where science is now pick, you know, catching up to 2000 year old Buddhist religion. Exactly. Correct. So, uh, and it has been, it's yeah. just, you know, getting into mainstream, and, you know, health insurance companies need to get up, caught up to the science in the mainstream and start mm -hmm. really, um, paying for a lot of these services. And I, you know, I had the president of blue cross blue shield of Arizona in my, in my building three weeks ago, and we were talking about, uh, the importance of doing, you know, they finally are paying for EMDR, right? They're finally paying for finally. that, you know, but we're looking at all these other modalities. And when I sat there and told them, and I said, you know, you all are spinning your wheels and spending a ton of capital each and every time somebody relapses, sending them back to treatment and all they're doing are meetings and talk therapy. Well, let me tell you, you're going to continue to pay for that person to go into treatment every six months because yeah. they're not healing from their trauma. Exactly. Yeah. So all of us know what EMDR is. Will you explain that yeah. to our listeners? Yeah. So it's eye movement desensitization uh, reprocessing. Did I get that right, doctor? You did. <laughs> yes. Um, and so um, essentially, you know, what they could, they can use a light bar, you know, some people choose tapping, right? And so all you're really doing is distracting the frontal lobe. You're distracting it in in order with somebody who's trained, my goodness, you need to be with somebody who's very, very good at mm -hmm. reprocessing because mm -hmm. it is really gut wrenching work, which is why a lot of people don't stick with it. Yeah. Um, when you're going through it, ooh, it is raw. It is tough. It is not necessarily easy. But when you're with somebody who really understands reprocessing and can guide you through that at the end of each session, you should be backgrounded so that you're not in some elevated state. But um, it's really important. It's all just getting you past the frontal lobe. 
Yeah, exactly. So I did EMDR in 2018 after my assault. And I mean, it got to a point where my mom didn't even want me to come around her. She's like, you're going to give me a stroke. And then I was like, and then I attempted my second suicide. And then my friend Mm -hmm. Elizabeth said, Tanya, you have PTSD. I'm like, no, I don't. I was never sexually assaulted. And I was never, I never went to war because we always think, you know, PTSD comes from people who have served and people who have been like physically or sexually assaulted. And she goes, Tanya, you know, better than that. And then I reached out to my therapist and my hypervigilance decreased. I was no longer triggered. In fact, a former employer looked exactly like my assaulter and I kept looking at him and I'm like, who does he look like? So for our listeners, EMDR is very, very, very powerful to heal through trauma and PTSD. Very yeah. helpful. I'm hearing nothing but good stuff about yeah. it. So uh, Brandon, I really like to go back and give people a little more of a sense of you as a kid. Yeah. What it's like to be going to a Catholic school. I know Santa Margarita. It's yeah. it's big time. They, mm-hmm. they recruit, I don't know how many pro football well, players. Carson Palmer, yeah. Carson Palmer was one of my best friends in high school, class in 98. Um, uh, so yeah. we both graduated together. We went to like, you know, it was all the athletes. So I played soccer internationally as well. Yeah. Um, and so like six guys from our Olympic development team, we all went to Santa Margarita, which is why we won the state championship every single year that I was there. Carson was on the football side. He was our starting quarterback as a freshman. Clearly he went on to the pros, won the Heisman. Um, so yeah, uh, but I started at Servite High School, um, believe yeah. it or not, mm-hmm. the all boys school, which you should know over by Fuller it's over in Anaheim. Um, and then I got kicked out after my freshman year. <laughs> you know, I, and, I, and the priest, the priest asked my parents or said, please do not send your child back to this school ever again. And so I was asked to leave. I was going to go to modern day, but the priest from Santa Margarita called the priest from modern day and said, don't you ever let this child into your school. And then my folks called the, the, the priest and the the principal down at Santa Margarita, they said no. And then the soccer coach convinced them, no, you got to let this guy in. Right. Because I was an athlete, decent at athletics and he wanted me on the team. And so that's how I got there. But, you know, I, you know, you look at those things, but it's all because of trauma. Like I was acting out as a child, you know, I was acting out and being a little rebel. And also I knew I was gay and that was really, really tough growing up gay in Orange County in the 1990s. Albeit, yes, there was a safe haven down in Laguna Beach, which I should have never been in that environment at age 16. Um, my therapist finally got me to admit all the sex that I was having with men in their forties and fifties was rape. I never looked at it that way ever in my life until I was in session at the age of 37. So, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I was acting out and, um, you know, was, I knew I was gay and it was really, really tough. Um, you know, not fitting necessarily the stereotype of in the nineties of what people thought gay was. And so being an athlete, being somewhat masculine, you're right. I I wasn't what the stereotypical, what society thought gay was in the nineties. Um, and so it was really even more difficult. And so, yeah, I started acting out and getting into trouble. I mean, shoot, I was a, I was already living a double life in the seventh grade because I was the student body president, right? I was an overachiever academically and athletically. So I was a student body president, but at the same time, I was soaking oranges in vodka, putting them in the freezer, taking them to school and sucking on them during during lunch break at school. And then I was bringing wine coolers to school in seventh grade and getting everybody drunk on wine coolers. Um, Wow. You know, so and then I, you know, got caught and. Some pretty <laughs> yeah. got kicked out again. <laughs> well, I, I know Servite for sure because uh I grew up like a block from uh Rosary High School. Oh yeah, the all, all those girls beautiful school. Catholic girls. Yeah. And I, I was going to Troy High School down the street and I was I wanted to be a Catholic so bad and go <laughs> meet all these girls up at <laughs> Rosary. <laughs> anyway, uh yeah, but those so here I mean, this is what's kind of fascinating about your story, Brandon, is you're living kind of the Orange County dream. You know, you're an athletic guy, handsome guy, uh on, on outward appearances. What did your parents did? What did they know or not know? What was that dynamic all about? Well, they didn't know much because they were working so much to provide that life. And I think that, you know, people also need to understand. And Tony, you alluded to this uh, um, just a little bit ago 
comparing traumas and that I, when I go and speak, I'm like, folks, you cannot compare traumas. Trauma is trauma. And it impacts the wiring and the bodies in almost in the same way, because a divorce for somebody, for a child is a traumatic life experience, mm-hmm. right? Parents who don't show up to their child's games, mm-hmm. that is a traumatic life experience. Heck, look at all the seniors who just lived through COVID that never got to go to a prom. Yeah. I know from us as an adults, we look at that and we can laugh and say, who cares? It's not a big deal because we've lived a life. But to a child in this, you know, in, in high school, taking away their prom is a really big deal. Taking away their athletic season is a really big deal. So yeah. we have to just acknowledge that trauma is trauma and that what is traumatic to me may not be traumatic to you. And what's traumatic to you may not be traumatic to me. I say that because, um, you know, my parents, my dad was a city manager, so he was gone a lot. And my mom was a very successful real estate agent in Orange County. And she was gone all the time. You know, they didn't have time to show up to my soccer games. They didn't have time to really show up. And so my house became the party house. They just were never, ever there. So I really had absent parents. Um, they loved me and they cared about me. And I know that. Um, but you know, priorities, right? They wanted to really constantly, they didn't come from much. And so they were really working hard to achieve this lifestyle and to maintain that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Albeit, man, I was like running my own life, you know, and I was doing my own thing without any consequences. Were you kind of, uh, well, first of all, before I ask that, siblings or did you have any? I do. I have two older sisters. Um, uh, I have been all two years apart and, you know, listen, um, I have really healed, almost completely healed from my mom. Um, my mom is, you know, she suffers mental health and she is a clinical narcissist. I mean, that's not, you know, a derogatory thing. Like, ah, you, she always talks about herself and thinks about herself. She's a narcissist. No, like clinically is a narcissist, right? Mm. But um, what we don't, what, what I'm able to now under, and she's unhealed. And so is my middle sister. And so is my oldest sister, right? They've never done the healing work with, with me and my two older sisters. I'm like, yo, we lived in the same household. Now, granted, I suffered sexual abuse that they did not, but I'm like, we still lived in the same household. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a lot of violence. Um, You know, I had knives chucked at my head um, in a fit of rage. And I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. Um, I was tied up to bedposts with neckties at one time. Um, So it's, we grew up in that same house, but where I'm at today and I can understand a little bit better now is that generational trauma is true. That if we do not in this moment on our journeys, take this opportunity to heal from the cuts that have made us bleed, I promise you this, you will end up bleeding on others who have never hurt you. What I understand now is that my mother suffered a lot of early childhood trauma, which included sex assault. She never healed from that trauma. And unfortunately, she passed that trauma on down to me. Because what, when I finally told my parents that I was molested as a child at the age of 37 was the first time I told them. And I'm 42, so five years ago. My mother minimized it. And she goes, I know you told me. And I said, what? I told you? She goes, yeah, you told me that he was licking your ear and biting your ear and giving you hickeys and, and you know, doing those things. She, and I said, well, what did you do about it? She goes, oh, we just made sure he never came again. And what, what happened is she's a narcissist. So she never even acknowledged that I was a drug addict when I was on life support, which eventually we'll get to after an overdose. She, and I told her that she told me, she goes, stop telling people that you were near death. You were never near death. And she did that because from her perspective, she didn't want the society to look at her and go, my God, like, how did you raise a son that ended up found behind a dumpster in an overdose? You know, she didn't, she always looked at it as to wait, I raised you a perfect child. Where did you go wrong? Like I didn't raise this. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can understand now that she suffered a lot of childhood trauma. She never healed from it. And unfortunately she passed a lot of that trauma on down to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have, uh, that in other words as you're growing up the stuff is going on this rape and by the way kids cannot give consent there's no such thing as consensual Mm -hmm. sex with children it's 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 even at 16 yeah Yeah. it's it's a it's a contradiction of terms there's no such thing as consent so as you're as you're going through this horrific abuse it's all bottled up inside it's not all of it all of it no friends no siblings, no parents to talk to about it. It's just all that pressure's inside. 
Yeah. And I, exactly. I mean, it couldn't tell anybody that I was gay. I couldn't tell anybody, you know, what I was doing I, and it really had no safe outlet um, yeah. to do that. So what did I do? I just started storing all of that trauma and that traumatic energy in my body, which when we'll get to it, you know, at some point in the show, um, how that ended up uh, exploding in my relapse in 2020. You know, it's the pressure of putting it out into society that you're the perfect family. You're the perfect mm -hmm. child. Survival right? mode. Exactly. It's like your mom, you know, was doing that. And during our trial, we had to kind of be that perfect family as well. We had to show up for the world. Yeah. We had to be that strong family. And that's where my trauma came. Well, my trauma yeah. came in way before that, but it was like just that pressure of having to show up and be perfect for the world and the community. And we're that happy family. So that all catches up with you. Oh yeah. In I mean, years that's... later. Yeah. Well, let yeah. Me, yeah. So when back in Orange County, you're living, you know, in, uh, in living a double things. life. Yeah. yeah, you're living mm -hmm. a double life. Let's talk about the facade. I mean, from yeah. uh, uh, the neighbors or the who, people in the community's perspective, what would they say about the Lee family mm -hmm. while this is always going on? Well, what they would say about me when they read my book that came out in 2019, mm -hmm. they were stunned and shocked. I mean, people who helped raise me as a child, you know, my friend's parents who were on my soccer teams and stuff, they took me to everywhere. And I will tell you this, if you look at childhood pictures of myself, like I truly look like the happiest little kid. I mean, survival mode, truly for me, I look like the happiest little kid. I'm an empath naturally in, in existence. So I was always caring about other people. I, I have such a gentle heart. So I was happy. I was loving. I was never mean. Um, and, and so for them to read what was really going on behind closed doors, Families who knew me called me in shock. They said, Brandon, we're sorry. We are mm -hmm. sorry that we never saw this. We are sorry that we never knew that any of this was happening. But again, that's how good I was at going into survival mode because yeah. I became an overachiever. <clears throat> because my parents weren't always around, I would overachieve to feel that love, to feel that affection, right? So it's like I had to win state championships in order for to get my parents to acknowledge, hey, good job. Mm -hmm. It's like I won Emmys. And that's when I would hear from my parents being like, hey, congratulations. We're proud of you won an Emmy. I'm like, damn, can't you just call me on a regular day and just give me a hug and tell me you love me without me having to win something? <laughs> Excuse me. But that was conditioned from the very, very beginning. And that made me say, okay, I have to put on this facade and I have to go do these things in order to achieve this. But also as a child, I had two older sisters that, man, they were so abusive to me. I was the little kid in that house, the lowest kid on the totem pole. And, you know, can't put blame on my sisters when they were hurting me, right? Because they were being hurt. Bully people, bully people. Right. And it goes chain. And, you know, I've finally let go a lot of the resentment from my older sisters because I was at times just treated so badly in the house. It was walking on eggshells. I truly did not know where I was going to get it from that day. Was I going to get it from my mom? Was I going to get it from my older sister? Or was I going to get it from my middle sister? It was coming at me. So I grew up walking on eggshells, so freaking timid. And I couldn't speak up because if I spoke up, I would get, I'd get whacked some way or another, either verbally or physically. And so what did that teach me as a child? Don't speak up, don't share anything, and just try to fucking make it through the day without yeah. getting hurt. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, from an outsider kind of point of view, it's like, oh, kids are squabbling. But from your point of view, with all the other stuff you're carrying, this is, this is layered trauma. Absolutely. It's violence. Uh, right. Yeah. Use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and you, what was your dad in all this? Was he just kind of off working kind of thing? Yeah. You know, I mean, and unfortunately my dad did suffer a lot of abuse. They are still married. Um, I mean, my gosh, I'll call my dad and just even recently call him on father's day, call him just randomly, you know, and I don't call my parents. I'm very, very self-sufficient as I have been since the age of 22. I don't call my parents for anything. I don't ask money. I don't, I don't need anything like that. Mm -hmm. And he can't even call me back. 
Um, you know, and, but I know it's not me, it's him. And unfortunately he suffered a lot of trauma as a child. He never healed from it. He's codependent on my mother. The hardest thing for me is this. When I told my dad about my sex abuse, he said he did not know. But my dad knew my mom. And my dad knew what I was going through. And he didn't protect me. Hmm. And he's still married to my mom. And that means he chose her. That's hurtful. Hmm. And, you know, even to this day, I just, I actually, I, I have zero resentment toward him now. I actually have a lot of empathy because how sad, how yeah. sad that he's never been able to heal himself. How sad that his wires are still crossed. How sad that his son is trying to have a relationship with him. He doesn't know how to, not that he doesn't want to, he doesn't know how to. And, and that's sad for him, but this is his journey. And I'm not sure why his soul is here or what his soul's journey is. I know why mine is, I do. Um, but I think at some point, maybe when he crosses over, he, he'll have a lot of healing to do on the other side. Um, because he hasn't done that healing here. Mm -hmm. And so it's really takes a lot of work, takes a lot of good support around you to understand that they will not change in this lifetime. And I have to accept that. And I have accepted that, but they will never change, but I can love them. I can love them. I can love them unconditionally because I know they love me unconditionally. They just don't yeah. know how to have a relationship, a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. So, so going back to the childhood mol molestation, when this all started, it sounds like you didn't have a relationship with your parents where you felt comfortable saying, Hey, so-and-so did this. And it felt like really kind of weird. Well, I it did to my mom and I didn't realize I had said something to my mom. Oh, because when he, yeah, at age yeah. 37, when and I she told her, she, of, she yeah. minimized it, but I'm like, you know, what red flag is this? And, I, and I'll ask you, doctor. So every Friday, my piano teacher would come. Well, every Friday after school, and I'm a child age seven, right? Seven, mm -hmm. eight years old, right? I can't really verbalize a lot, you know, at seven and eight, mm -hmm. especially with authority figures, because we all know this, that child molesters are not the stranger. Child molesters are the close family friends who have unfettered access to your child, in which yep. if your child did say anything, your parents would probably not believe you. They'll believe the adult. That's just naturally the way a lot of things are going to work these days. Right. Well, hopefully not these days. Hopefully that's changing. But, you know, every day Friday after school, I'd be at school. I'd be playing sports. I'd be coming home. And I'd be totally fine. And then I would run into my bedroom. I would take all the pillows in my bedroom and I would build a fort. And I would go hide in the fort. And my mom would say, damn it, Brandon, get out of there. You have piano lessons. And I would just stay in the fort. And then she would tell the piano teacher, you go get him. Mm. And he would come in the room and he would start peeling away the pillows one by one. And it was absolutely terrifying. The walk from my bedroom to the piano and the bench at the piano and sitting there with my head down knowing that every time I would make a mistake, he would grope me. Mm. Oh, wow. But it's like, what other red flag does a, does a parent need? But again, I believe this, that my mom's sexual trauma was more intense, if that's a fair word to say, than mine. Mm -hmm. So I think that when I told her that he was sticking his tongue down my ear, he was biting my ears and he was like groping me. I think my mom minimized it because it wasn't as intense as her experience. Mm -hmm. And since she never healed from it and she never got hell from it, she just goes, yeah, we told him not to come back again. So I did say something. Yeah. I did yeah. um, to yeah. her, but she didn't even, she, according to my dad, she never shared it with my dad mm -hmm. because my dad claims, and I believe him because I heard the shock in his voice at age 37 when I told him that, He's, he, and I believe him. He says, your mother never told me. And oh. he says, I need to process this. Give me a week and, and let's have a phone call. Did he call me back? No. No. Yeah. It, well, yeah. And it's an ugly topic, but yeah. you got to deal with it. 
do you think um you know with their abuse that's their normal yeah that's yeah. that's the way they live i mean that's their normal they, they're my goodness i don't even want to know they're they're in fight or flight they're always in crisis like but they because they never heal from it you're always going to be in and out of crisis mode mm -hmm. your whole life and so i see them from afar and i mean my goodness i am healed but i look at them and i'm like oh good god i just i feel so sad that you're living in that state and they don't even realize they're living in that state of chaos yeah well let's let's pause on this because i think that this whole the whole point of this discussion is for people to learn and let's talk about what parents should do so that people know what i'll just i'll just jump in and give you a few thoughts brandon then you fill in any gaps that i'm sure to miss okay but sure. number one is kids need to and parents need a really frank conversation about you know predator and prey and sex and you know the weirdness in the world and and let kids know that hey if anybody does something please let me know mm -hmm. uh because you're not at fault and if anybody ever threatens you uh don't worry about those threats you 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 open up the conversation right. number right. one number two is too deep in boy scouts it's called too deep leadership now i'm an eagle scout my three sons are eagle scouts and i found out about the child abuse there and i took mm. those plaques off the wall and threw them yep. in the trash yep. um, but that fortunately never occurred because i never let another adult ever be alone with my kid mm -hmm. correct i don't care who it was correct you know, uh, i'm not trying to go through life paranoid but there's so much of this weird stuff and people that are pedophiles are tend to be very charming. Oh yeah. Very. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very charming. And you would just never, okay. ever know. Well, that's why my kids were always with uh, a parent or an adult. Never, uh, never would I allow my child to be alone with a kid. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple simple things parents can do. What, what else, what am I missing Brandon that you could add to that? Well, I think, you know, um, it's really important that if that message is to be heard by the child, the parent has to have a good relationship with that child. Mm -hmm. You cannot be an absent parent and have a ch talk with your child and say, hey, if anything bad is happening, you know, you need to come to me. That will only happen when the parent has a good, constant relationship with that child, a trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. If that parent is showing up to their child's sports games, if they're showing up to their recitals, if they're showing up to their Peter, you know, teacher parent conferences, if they are just spending quality time with their child building a trusting relationship, then that works. Yeah. But it will not work. It will not work if that child doesn't have that kind of bond with the parent. Yeah. And unfortunately, child predators are so good. They recognize which parents have a good relationship with their child. And they usually find the parents that are not around very often. Yep. They they have a sense. Yeah. It's like a sixth sense. They're it evil. is. It's like a shark. It's they a can, predatory. They can, it is a predatory sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. they can sense the weak. Yeah. Prey. It's an eagle hovering over. You know. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. you know, and I grew up in Catholic school, and you know, listen. Fortunately, I never experienced. There were a lot of. There was a couple of priests that made me feel very, very, very uncomfortable. Very, but I was never abused by a priest. However they they used to put a cross around children to communicate with other priests who targets were mm -hmm. like this is known within the catholic church you know but you want to talk right you want to talk about generational trauma and abuse i mean look at all the work that the catholic archdiocese did to protect predators mm -hmm. They did. That's not me speaking bad about the Catholic Church. This is proven to be true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the way up to the very top. Mm -hmm. They would shuffle around these priests and these archbishops who were accused of being sexual predators. They would shuffle of them and move them around. What trauma did that do to all of the victims? Mm -hmm. Right. This is authority. Mm -hmm. You would go and tell an authority that a priest is doing this. And then all they would do is move that priest to another school. Yeah. So, yeah, you think, oh, so that's what I mean. Like, it's important that we have these safe, that children have that, that safe authority to go to. So in an, you know, in a Pollyanna world, yes, we would all have this society where a child goes, you know, you know, mom or dad, like this happened to me today. Right. 
it only works if they know that that parent is really going to protect them. Yeah. Then it works. Who do you recommend they turn to? Maybe a school counselor or who do you recommend? Yeah. You know, I wish school counselors had the time to really bond with the children like that. I wish we had a school counselor and a therapist at every school because, you know, mental health and trauma is, you know, trauma is the gateway. So if we, you know, a lot of times teachers and counselors know no more about a child than their own <laughs> parents do. Right. Because they're around them so much often. Um, but yeah, we, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have the exact answer as to who to turn to. I mean, I, I still turn to my mom, you know, I still turn to my mom at age seven, eight or nine. I don't remember the exact year that I did when that was happening, but you know, and essentially like I did tell her this and it was not the easiest, you know, she didn't take it well. Cause she's a narcissist. Um, you know, and, and I love her. So don't think that I'm just speaking so ill about my mom. I mean, she just mm-hmm. is what she is. Right. You know, but you, you say something to her and it's just like, oh, there's no way because I raised you, you know, there's, it's always on her and from her lens and her perspective on how people will view her mm-hmm. rather than the actual situation itself. Yeah. And, and in the scope of post-traumatic thriving, that's called the best classic denial. Yeah. And it's a, it's a normal reaction to say, oh, I can't believe it. That's a, that's normal, mm-hmm. but to get stuck there where you're yeah. still thinking that 10 years later yeah. uh, and haven't accepted the reality of the situation and dealt with it in an adult way. Uh, that's, that's where people shut down the trauma loop and they never process the whole thing. And that's what you got to do to heal from it. Exactly. Uh, well, when I was in the, Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, well, I, I was, <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> Go ahead. I know. I was just going to say, you know, when I when I uh, was at KTLA uh, as a as an anchor and reporter at KTLA five, you know, I'd be in the parking lot at the Sunset Bronson Studio parking lot, and I'd be getting high on GHB and meth, and you know that one overdose um, towards the very end, and I you know was found behind a dumpster and um, was taken to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in a coma on life support, and I was in that coma for about a week, and. You know, I came out of that. I came out of that coma. The chief neurosurgeon is sitting there at the edge of my bed and he's looking at me and he says, Brandon, you've been out for about a week. Uh, you have so much bleeding in your brain. We're going to have to do brain surgery on you in the next 48 hours. Otherwise, you're going to bleed out. And I looked at him and I said, the F you are. And I literally unhooked the wires of life support off my body. And I walked out of the hospital wearing the robe and the socks. And I'm walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I find my truck. And I remember getting in my truck like it was yesterday because this I vividly remember. And I'm sitting there in my truck and I'm wearing this hospital robe and I look at my wristband and I see my name on the wristband. And the definition of hopeless is this. I'm opening up the center console and I get out my meth pipe and I hot box my truck with meth. I don't remember anything from that experience other than I woke up in the same ER with the same team of doctors around me for the second time in two weeks who had saved my life. This little nurse came to me and she was four foot eight, beautiful black woman. And she came over to my, my bedside and she looked at me and she said, Brandon, do you believe in God? And I said, no, I don't. And who would? right? From all the trauma that I faced and being in Catholic school. I said, no, I don't. And she goes, that's okay. My God still believes in you. And here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you $10 in cash out of my own purse. And I want you to take this cash and I want you to go to my church on Melrose and Mansfield. They have an AA meeting there every Thursday. Make me that promise you'll go. And so I did and have been sober ever since that day until 2020. Okay. But the reason why I share that part of the story now is that when I was making amends a year sober, and I made that amends to my parents face to face. Now, when we make amends, we cannot point the finger at them and say, well, you know, you never showed up for this. You never did this. You did this to me. Da, da, da. No, 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 no. One of the things in AA, which I don't always agree with, is that you only you only, um, you only, only say, well, I'm sorry that I was an absent son. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry that I didn't, you know, when I was drugging, that I wasn't showing up for Thanksgiving or Christmases or, you know, those things. But I told her in that time, I said, you know, that a year ago, I overdosed and I was in a coma. I was on life support and I almost died and da, 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 da. And and I'm sorry that I never called you from the hospital because the, the, the chief neurosurgeon came down to me and goes, we need to call your family. And I looked at him and I said, I don't have family. And I was 28 years old. And he goes, what do you mean you don't have family? I was like, I don't have family. There's nobody to call. So my parents didn't even know that I was a drug user. So a year sober is when I first told them 
that I was a drug addict and what I had done all those years. Well, my mom calls me back about a month later and she goes, listen, you need to stop sharing that story with people. She goes, you know, I talked to my psychic and my psychic tells me that you were never even close to death, that that's not true and da, 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 da. Right. So even a year into sobriety where I really hadn't done a healing at all, I hadn't done none healing. I'm like, oh God, like, you know, oh gosh, maybe I didn't, you know, maybe I didn't. My mom's telling me that I didn't, you know, (laughs) and then now I look at it and I'm like, God, (laughs) she's that level of a narcissist that she didn't want the story getting out of me, a drug addict kid, you know, found behind a dumpster on life support, almost dead. Because in her world, people would look at her and go, what kind of parent are you? Mm-hmm. Your child is this, right? So even I'm just, I share that with you to give your listeners and your audience a better understanding of the kind of environment that I was raised in, you know? So the people who should protect you at all costs and believe you. I didn't always have that, Mm. even as an adult, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's not because they don't love me. It's they 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 love me the way they know how, with the best way that they know how. Well, I get it. I you know our parents all love us, but they come from a generation that was kind of you know stuffed the feelings, Mm -hmm. did all the classic wrong things, got stuck in the the denial you know cycle, and that's how they kind of got through World War II. Yeah. Uh, and I, I get it because I kind of lived with it. I made a, a resolution as a parent when I have four kids that I would tell them every day I loved them. Mm. I, I didn't hear that from my parents right. really till I was about 19. Uh, my mom said she loved me for the first time when I was 19, mm. that, which, you know, my mom's wonderful. I love her. She's a hundred years old, believe it or not. She's still <laughs> with us, but that's, that's the generation she was raised right. in. Number one, and that's what I did. I went to all my kids' uh, sporting things, um, even if they didn't want me there yeah. <laughs> or so they didn't want me there. <laughs> I, I just went. Um, I went on every camp out with them because I just know, you know, I just, that too deep thing with two adults right. was very important to me. So I went on a zillion camp outs, but I plugged in and I'm not, but today I'm getting the benefits because I'm buddies with all four of right. my kids. Right. right. And none of that, I think, I think my parent or my kids kind of emitted that vibe. Hey, predators, I'm not an easy target. Yeah. I, I hope they did. Yeah, because uh, dad's back here. Well, yeah. Well, and yeah. you were saying, you know, those, you know, we grew up, you know, our parents' generation and their parents' generation, which would be my grandparents' generation, they looked at vulnerability as a weakness. Right. Whereas so. in today's society, we see vulnerability as a strength. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's really the difference because, you know, sayings like this, don't air your dirty laundry, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. All that's telling you is don't let the outside world know that your life isn't that perfect. Right. Don't let the outside world know that you're struggling even just a little bit. Put on a persona of perfection. Well, all that did was suppress all of that trauma down further in. Well, guess what? You and I both know that eventually it's going to come out. Our bodies are not capable of storing all of that traumatic energy. It's going to come out. And unfortunately, it gets passed on generation to generation. Absolutely. Yeah, my parents, I mean, talk about war parents. I mean, my dad actually was in the war. He was a bomber Mm. pilot in World War II. My mom, you know, grew up in Germany. Dad dropped bombs on mom and all of a sudden next, (laughs) getting married and have four kids. Um, But my parents never told me not to feel, but, you know, you live by example. Or it's mm, like, you know, pick right. yourself by the boot, pick yourself up by the bootstrap. Like you were yeah. saying, get a job at Starbucks or paint the house or do whatever you need to do, but just don't feel my parents never said that. However, it was like living, you know, right. by example. Yeah, yeah. it is generational. Or I'll give you something to cry about. Could you imagine saying that to somebody in today's world? I'll give you something to cry about. Wow. Like, Forgot but if you think about, about it, right. But you think about it, our parents told us that, oh, I'll give you something to cry oh, about. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. what is that? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and as a parent, I never did. I never said that. I'll give you something to cry about. Fortunately, I never said that one. But I heard that one a lot growing up. Yeah. But I would say, particularly my youngest son, I'd say toughen up, buttercup. 
you know, <laughs> his little, he did this little snowflake thing. And one day he came up to me, he said, dad, I don't like it when you say toughen up buttercup. Aww. And I said, okay, I respect that. Thanks for telling me. And I, I apologize. And I stopped saying it, but yeah. we fortunately have that kind of relationship. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know? Well, you, obviously you do, if he felt comfortable enough to tell you, Hey dad, what you're telling me is making me feel uncomfortable. Like you must have a good relationship with him Yeah. because if, if a child doesn't, it's a very intimidating thing to go to a parent and say, I don't like the way you making me feel like children don't often tell mom and dad that, you know, because if they feel that way, they're afraid to get more of it. Exactly. Yeah. My parents knew everything about me. I mean, my God, I'm baby number four. Like I couldn't get away with anything. Oh, they know everything. <laughs> but we always had, we always had what we called kitchen table conversation. Mm. My parents always said, Hey, listen, there's three before you you're in high school. I know what you're going to do. You know, if you're going to go to a party, if you're going to have beer or whatever, call me, right. there'll be consequences but call me. And so my parents always had that open door conversation, that kitchen table conversation. Sadly, you know, today's in today's world, parents, um, I think kids have a lot of control over their parents to tell you the truth. And then mm -hmm. the parents go, they also have a mentality. I'm um, generally speaking, not mm -hmm. everybody, not all parents, but from the community that, you know, I work for and that I'm, you know, exposed to, it's kind of the mentality of, it won't happen to my kid, not my right. kid, right? Oh, yeah. My kid's not going to do drugs. My kid's not going to be sexually assaulted. My, it's not going to happen to my kids. And then it does. So yeah. it's kind of like, this is why we are doing this podcast to bring out awareness. So, you know, because you're a mom, your dad, partnership, you know, wife, wife, husband, husband, um, it can happen to your kid. It happened to my sister. It happened to you. It can happen. So, you know, for all the parents, for all the parents out there listening, it can happen to your kid. So keep your eyes open, keep your ears even more open and be just be aware because it yeah. can happen to your kid. So we are here with Brandon Lee. He's written this book, Mascara Boy. And uh, very fitting. Look at those eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, subtitled Bullied, Assaulted and Near Death, Surviving Trauma and Addiction. Uh, to go on, win more Emmys, do some successful things. But before we leave kind of the dive stage, Brandon, I mean, I, I would like, I think the audience should have a pretty good picture in mind. Here's a, a young kid, young man, uh, growing up in Orange County with all these wonderful things, uh, you know, student body president, you know, successful in sports, but there's trouble brewing because you're kicked out of was a um, modern day or uh, a servite survey kicked out of servite and modern day. I wasn't accepted into modern day because oh, okay, the servite priest called them and told them, don't set this kid. That's well, give us a little taste of what, what you're doing to get kicked out. What, what, what kind of a, uh, Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'll tell you exactly what the moment was. There was yeah. two, actually two moments in the same week. One of my teachers was telling me we were talking about, they were talking about masturbation and how it was a sin. And, and I just, I couldn't take it. And I said, well, I just find it interesting. Like, um, why can't, you know, I was challenging him about gay people and gay sex and da, da, da. And the look on this nun's face was like, what in the world? So that was on Monday. And I think it was by Wednesday, you know, all these seniors, they had something called senior square <laughs> and they used to take freshmen and, and you could not go over the line into senior square. If you did, they would punish you. Well, what the, I saw what they, these two seniors did to this poor little kid. They pushed him over the line into senior square. And then they took him and they threw him upside down in a trash can. And I had enough. It didn't happen to me, but I had had enough. So I put lighter fluid. They were sitting on a bench. I'm not proud of this at all. I, I laugh now because nobody was hurt, <laughs> but they were sitting on their bench in senior square. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. So I went over there and I put lighter fluid on their shoes and I let them on their shoelaces on fire. And the priest saw that and the priests were like, get out of here. And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't see what they did, but that's trauma, right? I was like, yeah, but you didn't see what they were doing to these poor kids and putting these kids head first into dumpsters and trash cans. And so, um, I was thrown out. Wow. 
That's awesome. <laughs> what a way to go. <laughs> Out with a bang. <laughs> See, I, I, I cut the dial wow. down a little bit. I flew under the radar and I did a lot of things that they're still, still searching for the perpetrators to this day. Amazing. Troy High School. But <laughs> I like it. You turn the dial way up, baby. <laughs> Oh, my God, oh that's funny. good. I mean, we're just throwing water balloons and stuff like that. Lighter fluid? That's good. Lighting your enemies on fire. Some tennis balls from the from the upstairs balcony. That's beautiful. Okay. Well, you should have been kicked out. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely okay. deserve to be kicked out. Yeah. So you're having fun. What did your friends think? What do people, what do the kids around you think about you? Um, you know, I had a lot of friends, like I was fairly popular, you know, I was, I was fairly, I was a fairly popular guy, you know, and I was really friendly with a lot of people. I didn't, I was like one of those guys. I actually didn't have enemies. Like I never got into fist fights. I never got into brawls. Like trauma for me never looked that way. Uh -huh. Like, you know how some people like go out there and they're really aggressive and they're really fighting. I mean, they like turning into MMA fighters. They're fighting everybody. And you know, that's actually one reason why I cannot physically sit down and watch an MMA fight. I can't mm. do it. I see that violence and I cringe. I have to turn the TV off. The moment I see somebody hurt another person, I can't do it. And so, you know, the, the, the toxic masculinity crowds are like, oh, you're such a man, man, man. You know, you can't watch these are tough guys. You want to know why I look at those two guys in the ring and immediately I think like, what happened to you as a child? Yeah. Like what happened to you as a child that you want to beat the shit out of another person? Yeah. You know, and you want to mm -hmm. get hurt and you enjoy that pain. Yeah. You know, People are like, oh, they, they love to do it. It's a sport. I'm like, no, 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 no. They, they suffered a lot of trauma to get them to that point. You know, so yeah. I was never a fighter. I was always a lover. Yeah. Okay. Remember that whole oh. Tito Ortiz, uh, Randy Cartu ultimate fight is when it was all coming out. He was in Orange County. They had a fight up in uh, Vegas and Tito was very arrogant, came out with, you know, the presumed winner. And the other guy, Randy Cortez, I think I said his name right literally turned him up uh, upside down and spanked him. And, and anyway, the people there and I met <laughs> Tito and all this, it was like, there's a, there's a special attraction that gets all these people plugged into this. Yeah. And I don't get it. <laughs> it's a, but you see all that trauma that's happened out there, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. You know never, how many people experience trauma. I mean, it's like oh, 80, okay. 80%, 90% of people eight, experience 80, trauma. Yeah, 80, some level. 66 to 85% by college age. You know, yeah, I've so never, look how much unresolved trauma there is. So no wonder why there's a, yeah. there's a, yeah. 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 So, you know, you're like that. You know, ironically, um, well, one, I never even thought about MMA, right? Like with the perspective that you just shared with us. Last night, I'm watching a Netflix show. I forgot the name of it. Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, I forgot. But anyway, the the kid was experiencing a lot of childhood trauma. Uh, he, now he's an adult. He went into a cage, did sparring, got the, you know what, out, you know, beat the shit out of, right? Excuse my language. Um, but it all now with that perspective that you just gave me, I'm like, that totally makes sense. Yeah. And when he was in the cage, his mom was watching him and she was just sitting back and she was very proud of her boy. Yeah. Yeah. So question I got to ask you, Brandon, when I, when I was growing up in Orange County, I knew about, you know, this is back in the time of, you know, those old movies like Blazing Saddles and uh, Airplane, where society <laughs> as a whole had not really grown up on the whole LGBT issue. Right. And there are a lot of inappropriate jokes and all of that. And, um, you know, growing up uh, right basically down the street from you, going to Troy High School, I knew about the gay bars in Laguna Beach. I knew about the Boom Boom Room and Woody's, and there was maybe another one I forgot. Main street. Was that it? Yeah. But it didn't even occur to me that, you know, I guess what I'm getting at, what what information came your way where it was even an option to go down uh, and hang out the gay bars and sell sex? What, what, what? To How did I find it at yeah. age 15, 16? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think growing up, you know, growing up in those communities, like you just knew. Um, I think through even word of mouth because of, as you said, a lot of gay slang, like, oh, you're going to go down to the boom, boom room, you know? So it was just always just kind of there. And then you just research it a little bit. You're like, well, what is this place? You know, knowing that I was gay, I was like, well, what is this place? You know, and you go, you go find those things. So I, 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 
because Orange County was is I don't think it's well, it's definitely not as conservative as it was back when I was there in the 80s and 90s. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Because we just be even be standing on the street corner and people would drive by and they would spit at us and they would throw stuff at us if we were just outside on the sidewalk, you know, and I remember that mm-hmm. very, very vividly, you know, and I was 16, right? 16 at the gay bars should not have been there. Having sex with older men should not have been doing that or they shouldn't have been doing that with me because I didn't have the enough frontal lobe stuff. You know, my brain is still being formed. I couldn't even make a conscious decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and besides I was, you know, I know why I was doing that. You know, I wanted that affection. I might think my body just wanted that love. They wanted that adult figure, something like that was driving it, you know? And, but yeah, it was just, God, it's tough. You know, I mean, I used to always say, I mean, this is the denial of trauma. It, it took me up until I started doing talk therapy about seven years ago I wouldn't even admit that like people making gay jokes in my whole life that I always told people I I didn't have a hard coming out story. I used to tell people that, nah, man, it was easy. I didn't have a tough time at all. (laughs) It was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? It was, it was so traumatic knowing that you're gay and you can't tell people and you can't Mm -hmm. be your authentic self. Like imagine that, you know, like imagine you cannot be your authentic self (laughs) at all. And so you just, you, I became a pro at, you know, really putting on a, a double life and, and living a projected image of myself. Mm-hmm. And tell us about coming out. What was that all about? Yeah, it was really not easy, man, if I'm being honest with you. Um, How I told old were my, you? I was uh, 19 years old. Okay. Um, uh, I was 19, about to move to New York City to go to NYU. I did tell, um, I did tell my sister, um, this is really, really sad. I told my middle sister and she looked at me and she goes, you know, she really wasn't loving about it. But I was going to tell my grandmother because I had a really close connection with my grandmother. My grandmother was such a motherly figure and she was so loving and so warm and so welcoming. And I, I th- she's the one person I truly felt safe around my grandmother. And my sister goes, don't you dare. Don't you dare tell grandma. You will kill her. If you tell her that you will send her to her grave. And I truly believe that. Like she would die of a heart attack if I told her that. So I, I I never told her, but I moved to New York City and about three weeks after I was there, I was like, I went to a gay bar the first night I moved to New York City because why wouldn't I? And so I went there and I was like, oh my God, there's guys about my age and they're all gay and they're all having a good time and they're all smiling. So as soon as I found that tribe within three weeks, I called everybody. I had a day timer. You know, we had day timers back right. then. I went through the day timer and I just called about 30 people. And I did tell my mom and my mom says this. She goes, you better be sure about it. You better be sure. Cause once you go out, you can never go back in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it wasn't like, I love you. I support you. And I love you unconditionally. It was just like, are you sure? You better be sure because once you open your mouth and you say that to the world, you can never go back in. I called my, uh, my I asked her because I was so scared. I was like, will you tell dad? And she goes, hell no, I'm not telling your father. You tell him. So I said, okay. And so I called my dad and my dad goes, it was a lot of silence. And then he goes, well, he goes, I think it's a choice. And I think you're making this choice. Um, he goes, but he goes, I'll support you. I'll support whatever choice you make. Um, and it was kind of cold, um, like that, you know, but they've never, they never once asked me, like, are you dating anybody? I mean, they never even asked me to this day. Like, are you dating anybody? Do you love anybody? Are you, you know, are you like going to get married? You know, do you want those things? My parents don't ask me that, you know, Mm. they never once asked me that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow. Okay. So even to this day, I mean, like if I get married and I will get married one day, you know, and I'll ha- settle down and have a partner and, you know, my parents won't be there. Why would they be there? I mean, they, they've never acknowledged my relationship and that's not a decision made out of resentment. It's just a, a decision that, no, I want people around there who are going to celebrate that relationship because they're invested in it. You know, yes. I think those days all of like, oh, well, we have to invite mom and dad because they're family or we have to invite so-and-so because they're blood. Oh, no, 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 no. That is generational. And absolutely not. And I tell people that all the time, just because of your parents doesn't mean they have to be your mom and dad in that, in that way to your inner child. Like I have a chosen, I have people like to my chosen family who are around me and they fill that need. They yeah. fill that void. You know, we need a mom. We need that motherly figure. We need that fatherly figure. But you know what? There are people around me in my life today. They look at me and they're like, how your parents aren't as present in your life is just unreal to us. And, um, but I have those voids filled and those are the kinds of people who will sell who I choose to celebrate my life with. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for saying that because in the world of recovery, it's like, you know, whenever I facilitate groups, they say, you know, 
well, what if, what if, you know, I reach out to my family, but the family is the one that's causing, you know, that's contributing to the problem. And I said, Hey, listen, just because somebody shares the same blood as you doesn't mean that they need to be part of your life. It doesn't mean that way. So that's why, you know, people in recovery, they go to AA or smart recovery. So they get some sort of connection and find that new fellowship, that new family. Well, how about this? So this is one of the reasons also why I stepped away from the AA program. When I was first getting sober, my sponsor, <clears throat> he told me I had to call my mom every Sunday. I had to call my mom every Sunday. I, it was my responsibility to call in to my parents to have conversations with them. And he made me call my mom every Sunday. And I would end those conversations in tears because I would say, I love you, mom. And she'd be like, okay, and hang up. And I would say, hey, mom, how are you? And it would just be all about her for that full hour. Never like, how are you? How's recovery? You know, my parents have never once asked me, how's recovery? Are you still sober? Or like, how are you doing on your recovery? They never once asked me that. And so I told my sponsor, I'm like, these phone calls are making me feel terrible, but he made me do it. He goes, because one day your parents will be gone and you want to make sure that you cleaned your side of the street and that you were responsible for your side of the street so that you don't carry any guilt or shame in the rest of your life. Well, holy cow, I did that for about seven or eight years. And then my therapist goes, oh, my God, stop. You do not have to call your parents anymore. She goes, that was the most terrible advice that was given to you by somebody in AA, your sponsor. And my therapist goes, you are thirsty. You are dehydrated. And you're in the desert and you go to this well and you are constantly pulling up this well, hoping for water. And she goes, Brandon, I'm going to tell you, it's always going to be filled with sand. Mm -hmm. She goes, you're going to this well, hungry for that love, hungry for that affection. But Brandon, I'm telling you, it won't be there. You know, and so. um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very powerful. Yeah, um, it is. And I, I think it might be a good time to move on to survive because it yep. sounds like we've taught, I mean, what strikes about strikes me about your story, Brandon, is here you are growing up in Orange County. I mean, you have this, not just one perpetrator, but three perpetrator, adult perpetrators, molesting a young boy starting at seven. I mean, that's triple doses of trauma right there. And then you have parents who, you know, you just want to communicate with and have that natural dynamic that every kid wants to have. You don't have that. You're gay, which is in and of itself, hopefully not traumatic, but the fact that you can't talk about it until you're 19 and through with high school has got to be traumatic insofar as you not able to be communicating who you really are. Uh, I don't want to put any it words stunts in your, your mouth. Well, no, it stunts your emotional growth. Yeah. Because if you understand as a straight boy, I would have had a, several girlfriends um, by the time I'm 18 years old, right? You're able to date in high school. You're able to have those high school crushes. That's really an important, those relationships don't last, right? Or they did in our parents' generation and they should have never lasted, right? But they, <laughs> the, but they ended up getting married and having terrible toxic relationships. <laughs> However, um, as a gay man back in the day when being gay was not accepted, it stunted my emotional growth. Right. Sure. And so, because I never had those early stages. So that's why when I was in like my thirties, I was experiencing the feelings of a 16 year old boy having a crush on a man in my thirties. So like, it's taken a long time for me to catch up to my emotional uh, relationship maturity. So absolutely it's traumatic that I couldn't have a high school crush that I couldn't go to prom with somebody that I loved or was in love with while all my other friends were able to have girlfriends and go do those things. So it absolutely, absolutely was traumatic in that sense. Yeah. 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 You know, going back to what you said before we were going to um, talk about going on a break, we search for love in all the wrong places sometimes. Right. So it's like, you went to the well or your therapist was saying, Hey, go to the well in the middle of the desert. All you're going to find is sand. I think that is like such a great metaphor because so many people search for love in all the wrong places. It's like, mm. okay, if I do this, I'm going to get appreciation. If I do that, I'm going to get acknowledgement. If I do this, you know, I'm going to get, you know, a hug from my mom and my dad. Where at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you'll never get it. And you said it earlier on in the podcast too, 
you'll never get that attention, that love and affection from your parents. They won't right. change. And, but here's the other thing too, and it's just really, I think, so crucial, is that you know, I don't, my sponsor, his intent was not bad by having me do that, but he didn't have the study and the education to take his lens of perspective from his life off and to be able to put my perspective on. Mm -hmm. But a trained therapist and doctors, they are able to do that because they have the training to do that. So he was essentially giving me advice from his own perspective on his life because he had a great relationship with his parents. So calling his parents every Sunday and having a conversation then was totally normal and healthy, which is one of the reasons why I don't like the sponsorship program necessarily within the AA program, because a lot of them are giving advice to very vulnerable people and they're giving advice without any training or coaching or any, they're just their mm. own life experience. But sometimes that advice can be very, very damaging for the folks that they're working with. Yeah. That's good information right there. That's yeah. good insight. Well, it's a great story. Uh, everybody grab Mascara Boy, subtitled Bullied, Assaulted, and Their Death, Surviving Trauma and Addiction. Uh, I, I'd like to move into the survive stage, if that's okay. With yeah, everyone. let's do it. Um, so let's take a quick break, okay. um, and then we'll come back and we will do that here on Post Traumatic Thriving, where we die, survive, or thrive. The choice is yours. Thanks for supporting our podcast. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe and follow us on your favorite social media. For books, merchandise, or to donate, visit coreiq.com. Post Traumatic Thriving is produced by Core IQ, a nonprofit with a mission to teach the life skills we all need but are not taught in school. Core IQ and the Post Traumatic Thriving podcast are for informational purposes only and do not provide medical or mental health advice. Always consult with your licensed medical and mental health care providers.